Okay, the recording has started. Casey, I want to turn it over to you and you can, you can introduce the team. Excellent. Hey, thank you, Steve. And I wanted to say thank you. Good afternoon and good evening to wherever you may be today. Um, just wanted to thank everybody for being here and taking time out of their day. We've got some phenomenal speakers today, so I'm really excited to have some of our team here um, presenting on the product. So this will be um, both a little bit of an overview of kind of pre-pandemic, but a very good deep dive into uh, some of our product line. And Kristen, if you can go ahead and go to the next slide. And then kind of like a, a real quick recap of some of the most common questions I think that we're getting asked that I wanted to cover uh, towards the end. But with us today, we have Matt Camusi up on the top left hand corner of the screen. He's the senior program manager for Surface in the CXP team. He's been here at Microsoft for nine years, specializing in public sector, technical skilling and performance analysis. Uh, I learned something new about Matt, uh, which is embarrassingly, he uh, is into PC and board gaming, D&D, digital arts and esports, which was pretty awesome to hear. To the right, Kristen Horvath, uh, Senior Specialist in Higher Education, five years at Microsoft and 13 years of experience in education. And when she's not working, you can find her running marathons, which congratulations on the Chicago Marathon just recently, and planning a wedding, which are both full-time jobs. <laughs> and we also have Frank joining us as well, which I'm very thrilled to uh, have him on the uh, team as well presenting today. He's a lifelong uh, hardware geek living the dream working at Microsoft and the Surface team at Microsoft now for 10 years. Congratulations on that big accomplishment. Uh, he heads up the technical marketing team focused on deployment management security along with uh, all things Surface Hub. During his free time, he likes to hike uh, in the woods and he is a scouts leader for his boys. And last but not least, myself. Um, I think I actually recognize a few of your names. I used to be in higher education. Uh, I'm Casey Hill, I'm a Surface Specialist, been at Microsoft now for six years and in higher education for 21. Um, you can usually find me outside of work cheering my kiddos uh, in sporting events, fishing, playing poker, and obviously watching a lot of football. So with that said, uh, thank you all again for joining and I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Kristen. Sounds good. I appreciate it, Case. And, and it's five o'clock for us on the East Coast, so I'm going to keep this real casual and, and open. I mean, you guys have been some, through some really cool uh, sessions today, and Casey's, Casey and I are going to keep it real short on our part, too, um, because we have some rock stars uh, to talk through probably two of our most uh, amazing products, to be quite honest. But I want to kind of level set for a second um, and and I, I recognize names as well on this call, which is awesome. But in, in my role this year, um, I am looking after all higher education customers nationally. Um, and so really building out a stronger strategy. And so presenting to you guys today is awesome um, because I definitely wanna hear feedback from you as well. But, but one of the parts of my job that's been very interesting over the past, uh, well, over the past five years, but spe specifically as of late is hearing feedback um, from our, our CIOs and, and a lot of leadership in the IT space, but also on the also on the university side on a whole um, that represent the end users. Um, I typically don't like to read quotes uh, directly or read slides directly, but I thought this quote was very interesting um, from the CIO at Portland State, um, and I, I will read it out loud because I think it's 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 very powerful, but. Many students, faculty, and staff have now discovered that they actually can learn and work remotely more effectively than they ever imagined. This worldwide realization is going to permanently change the landscape for years to come. Institutions that are able to quickly adapt and change with the world around them will survive. Those that don't will either have many difficult years or cease to exist. And I think that's, it's just a, I'm probably stating the obvious to a lot of you, um, but this is something that higher education actually was experiencing well before the pandemic and um, this was the pandemic was kind of the proverbial nail on the coffin for for many in terms of we've got to change and we've got to transform and and how do we go about doing that and i think that's been the biggest challenge of where do we where do we start and and how can a lot of a lot of customers are looking at how can microsoft help us um, create that framework of change um, so i think one of the one of the you know approaches and really the, the way we look at this is the very holistic approach of how we can help you guys enable hybrid learning because we know this is a, a, a demand of, of end users um, and when we look at that it's the really those four elements that are on the screen there at the center of that for us that matters most that we're most passionate about 
are those innovative devices um, to, to really modernize those learning spaces. But it, it comes with the entire holistic experience around the platform, all of the data insights that we can provide, the training, the, the PD, that deployment service uh, and, and, and assistance that we can provide based on a layer of trust, security, accessibility that you know is important to your customers and that streamlined management piece. But again, like I said, at the center of that are those innovative devices. And, and with that, I'm going to pass it off to, to Frank. Um, Frank has been integral in so many of our education conversations as of late yeah. to talk about one of our um, most exciting devices, Surface Hub, and how that really makes an impact in, um, in hybrid learning spaces. So I'll pass it to Frank. He's going to kind of talk you through um, what Hub's all about and how, you know, really more of the technical aspects of Hub and how to integrate those into your environment. Thank you, Kristen. So maybe if we can stop uh, presenting yep. the content for just a second and we'll, uh, so before I get started, I want to give a quick uh, tip to everybody. If you look at the video of me coming through to you and right click anywhere inside of there and click on fit to frame, it'll make me full screen and all the content that I want to send through to you available so that you can see it. I've been trying to convince the Teams team to add that as a feature that I control, but it is something that you control. So, uh, so hey, welcome. I'm Frank Buckholtz. Thanks for the introduction. I work on the Surface Commercial Marketing team, as I've described in my little bio there, and it's a pleasure to talk to you about Surface Hub. Um, Surface Hub has been around for a little while within Microsoft. We launched it almost about uh, seven years ago, and we're able to bring now what we think of as the second generation of the device to, into the market space. But what are the cool things, one of the cool things about Surface Hub is its origins. It actually started with a product that we called Perceptipixel, and I actually used to work for Perceptipixel. And when I did, we were selling Perceptipixel devices mostly into media. In this case, we were selling it to CNN. And so back in the 2008 election, when John King was essentially standing up against his magic wall, he was using a Perceptive Pixel device, and now he uses a Surface Hub device in order to drive that magic wall. Now, if you've watched the elections, which in the US, I'm going to imagine that you couldn't have avoided it. Um, but if, if you watched it and you watched it on CNN or any other pieces, you saw that when you're standing next to a device, there's a little bit of show business to it, right? It's not a lot different for an educator to be able to stand up next to a large screen device and present a degree of content. But how do we use the Surface Hub in more of an education platform so that you can either walk up and use a device or have a device that's dedicated to you? And I'm going to show you these two basic scenarios. And then I'm going to break the fourth wall here and show you how we're set up in our studio in order for you to probably be able to simulate or build out an, uh, an environment that's somewhat like ours or based on different budget value or numbers, how you can kind of piecemeal it together in order to bring these types of things to life. And then we'll show you some tips and tricks that we use in order to deliver a session like this. Um, because you could be a student here and I'm the educator and I'm going to talk to you through a camera as well as see myself as well as present content and be able to do work on the Surface Hub. So let's imagine that I'm an educator and I move from space to space every few hours, meaning I have one class on one side of campus or in one room and I walk into another side and every room maybe has a Surface Hub in it. Um, now, whether it is set up as a digital studio so that I can reach out to remote people is one thing, but let's imagine if I wanted to just walk up to this device. So I'm going to take a step back and stand next to this big, beautiful 85-inch Surface Hub. And when I'm standing next to it, um, I want to be able to use this device as a walk-up-and-use device. Now, the first things that I could do is I could literally just start the call or start the class. And the class could have people in the class with me, but there could be people that are remote as well. So in this case, I've essentially created a Teams meeting that's going to take place, and they're going to join this meeting. And in this case, I have four students that are dialing into my meeting, and they're going to join this meeting with me. Now, some of them are somewhat famous, um, like when Aaron isn't off losing football games for the Green Bay Packers. Oh, ouch. Did I say that? Um, He's, uh, he's a student in my class. Or Steve Aoki, when he's not DJing in Las Vegas, and then uh, two other people that I have no idea are, we just took their pictures and added them to our session. But 
what I'm able to do now is clearly see them and they're able to see me through the camera that I'm talking to you through. In fact, they could probably even see themselves much like you can see yourself as well. But being able to walk into a space and quickly just one touch join, I'm able to get that type of work done. The other thing that I could easily do is I could open up a whiteboard and I could take the content and actually start using the whiteboard to actually start inner, inner, <laughs> Start, inter, uh, start working with them in an integrated way so that they have access to this whiteboard as well. They actually, by using Teams and using this new version of Teams that's on Surface Hub, they have the ability to start adding their content to this whiteboard. They might not be on a Surface Hub. They might be on a their own device, maybe an iPhone, maybe a um, Surface uh, Laptop Studio that Matt's going to show you, some other type of device where they have a whiteboarding capability and a Teams device in order to interact. And it makes everybody essentially a front row member of the class. But the other thing that I could do is I could actually take content from a secondary device. And so I'm going to walk here and show you that if I grab this beautiful Surface Book 3, I can easily um, take the content of this device. And I use Windows Hello to log into it. And if I use Windows K, which allows me to connect the content that's on this Book 3 onto the Surface Hub, I see that the Surface Hub is listed, the friendly name in the bottom corner. It says there's an 85-inch Surface Hub. So I tap on that, and I'm able to, easily able to take the content that I have on the device that I walked into the classroom with. Maybe this is my lesson plan. This is what I plan to present. But I can now actually set this device down, and maybe I set it down on the other side of the room. But I'm able to now have full control back and forth between the device that I casted from back to the device that I actually am casting in that space. So this allows me to do many different things of being able to walk into a space, start a class, easily whiteboard with everybody in my class, and they have all front row participation, and then I'm able to take content. And in this case, maybe I want to launch something as complex as Photoshop onto this device. And I'm able to maybe do some degree of annotation or work because I have complete ink back, touch back, back to the device that I'm casting from. And then when I'm done with the class, um, one of the cool things that I can do is I can actually close the device and then the device will disconnect from the Surface Hub. And then all the content that I created or changed is left on the device that I walked into the classroom with and nothing is left on the Surface Hub. Now that I call Surface Hub 100. Surface Hub 100 is the idea that I can walk up to a Surface Hub, either join a meeting, whiteboard, or be able to take content off of a device and cast it on here. The other thing that I can do in Surface Hub 100 would be to launch something like a web browser or be able to launch any application that's already installed on the device. Like in this case, maybe I want to come in and open up maybe a map um, of my local area. And so I have all this capability to be able to walk into this space and be able to do all these types of things without having to authenticate to the device. And I can now essentially get started with this device almost immediately. Now, the second piece that I would show is what I like to think of as Surface Hub 200, which is more of an authenticated experience, meaning that maybe I didn't want to walk into the classroom with my device. <coughs> Excuse me. Maybe I want to instead get to all of my Office 365 content that's on the Surface Hub, and I can easily do that with passwordless authentication off of my phone. And so I'm gonna come in, and I'm gonna hit on this device, My Meetings and Files, and one of the things that you'll notice is I can hit Sign In, and as soon as I hit Sign In, it will actually give me a list of users that are scheduled to be in this meeting. One of those users is me as the teacher, and I'm gonna pretend to be this person called Jane Demo for the next couple minutes. So I hit Jane Demo's name and then I hit continue. I don't have to even type in my own name and I don't have to type in a password on the device either. And so if I hit send notification, it'll send a notification to my phone. And in this case, I go ahead and hit the Microsoft Authenticator app, put my fingerprint against the, um, the reader and uh, be able to log into this device. So, um, I actually hit something that said request denied. And yes, this is me. Um, are you trying to send, what is the number shown? Oh, 41. Oh, we changed it. That's interesting that they changed the authentication means where it used to show three numbers up on the screen and now it, you have to type in the number. And so uh, I was able to do that and now it logs me in to the Surface Hub. Now, 
The cool part is it's downloading all my most recently used files, or at least a stub to them, and it also provides what's called single sign-on. Single sign-on means that I no longer have to sign into the device in order to authenticate to it to other applications. So now if I open up Word or PowerPoint or Excel, it'll log me into each of those different applications without having to sign into any other one. Now, there's a small bug within my tenant that it usually requires me to sign in twice. So we use quad authentication on our devices. And that's not true. It's actually a small bug on my tenant. But um, you'll see that it quickly logs me in. So imagine you're a teacher. You've walked up to the device. Normally, it just asks you to log in once. And then once you're authenticated onto the device, it usually takes about 30 seconds. Then you have free access to get to all of your content. And so here's the content that will come up on the screen. And so maybe one of those pieces of content is a PowerPoint. So I'm going to hit this Surface Hub Army CIO, and it'll actually open up that content straight from the internet and be able to pull that in. And let's see, as in any demo, um, I seem to be hitting some demo gremlins. And so I, uh, there's always a little bit of a gremlin in a live demo, and this one is, is finding me here pretty quickly. But it'll sign me in. Normally, I wouldn't have to sign in to an application in order to open it up. And again, it's probably going to do my quad. Nope. It's going to start to load it. The other thing, though, would be is that what I really want to show is if I jump into the device for a second, I want to be able to show the ability to open up the Microsoft Edge browser, and I want to be able to make this Edge browser my own. So I'm going to close it for the one that I opened up already and be able to open up a new one. And so I can open up this Microsoft Edge browser, but one of the things you'll see that it does within the device is it will prompt me and ask me if I want to sync my profile. Syncing my profile, I think, is the coolest capability on the Surface Hub because when I hit sync, it will actually pull down my passwords, my bookmarks, all my tabs, everything that I want that I have is now listed across the top of the device. So maybe if we jump into the device for just a second, you'll see that at the top of the device, I have the ability to open up, say, my office.com environment, and that logs me in as Frank into my environment. The other thing that I could do is I could actually type something like, hey, I want to go into my actual mail, and I can open up my mail without having to sync these different pieces of content. And maybe in that mail, I actually have a Zoom meeting in that mail, so I could actually tap on Zoom, and it would actually go out and use the Edge browser in order to join a Zoom meeting. So all these different capabilities are super um, strong. I'm going to, feels like I'm saturating the screen with a little bit of bright white light. So let me... Turn that down a little bit. Whoops, a little too too much. You get to see the refresh of our device. Um, but in, in this space, I'm able to now use this in order to show that different type of capability. Now, hopefully that makes a sense from how I can get to content that I pull in from the cloud, how I can easily get to my own bookmarks and other pieces. Um, another thing that I could do is I could even jump inside the device for a second and show how I can get into Teams. And this is my full-blown Teams environment where I could maybe get into my classroom's team site and be able to see all of that content that they're using and the assignments they're pushing in. And maybe some student added some piece that I want to be able to access through this different location. I can do all of this because of that quick authentication that I made to the device and I'm able to use it in that different space. Now, all of that brings us back to um, that is essentially a walk up and use experience with a generic device that would be in a meeting space. Now, what some professors do is we've actually worked in these different spaces where um, whether somebody like um, Dr. Mohan, who is a business professor up at the university or up at Northwestern University, or another professor that we work with, um, Dr. Kellerman, who works at the University of New South Wales down in Australia as an engineering professor, they use their own dedicated Surface device. And so here is a device, in this case, where we have this Surface device, and this is a device that has a dedicated operating system on it. The, the, the device that I just showed you has more of a walk-up-and-use version of Windows 10 that we call Windows 10 Team Edition, where this is running literally Windows 11. So if I was to tap my fingerprint against the fingerprint reader, it'll go straight into Windows 11, and now I could use this to get to all of my content because this is essentially my device. I use this device every day, and I'm able to use this to drive content and drive participation. So all of the things that I just showed you I could do on the Surface Hub, 
I could do that much faster if this was device was assigned to me as a user and I can run any application on this device that I have in my own portfolio as well. Now, as we come out of this, I want to show you a little bit of what I was saying was inside baseball or being able to show you kind of the behind the scenes piece. So I'm going to go ahead and um, open up my Surface Duo that I have here, and I'm going to look for this particular session, and I'm going to join this meeting right now. I'm going to turn my audio off so I don't get a feedback loop. Um, but if you see Frank BU come into the call, if you can make me a presenter, um, then I can go ahead and share my screen. And so if you can uh, lo um, spotlight me, there we go. So I'm going to turn this device around. And then, so now I want to do a little bit of inside baseball and show you kind of breaking the fourth plane, right? So first two things that we have is we, we use two monitors. So the, up at the top, you see that there's actually a camera and that camera is what is filming me and what I, you can see me on if you're looking in the screen. Um, the, cam the, the device that's below the camera is essentially the class. So that is the, the class that essentially, that's the call that you all are in. And that way I can see you when you're in the class. And so I can interact with you and see everybody that's in the class and be able to know what you, you are asking or your facial expressions or other pieces <coughs> that you have. And then the third monitor at the very bottom is my feedback monitor so I can see what I look like as I'm sending that through to you. So those are kind of three important things to be able to have is I want to have a nice camera that is shooting me, but we can talk about this, that you don't have to have the same type of camera solution that we have here. You can actually do it with a standard camera like this Logitech Brio. And so this Brio here, it could be a camera that you have on a tripod that's connected into your device and then your device is able to join a call. And then if you hooked up a second monitor to your device, you could see both the class and you could see also what you look like um, as you're uh, casting that into the session. So know that these are the types of solutions that we have. We also have a producer, and this is Alan. So um, now Alan is uh, sitting at a device, but you could do this all yourself um, because one of the cool things that I wanna show you is Alan has in front of him what he calls a stream deck. And the stream deck can be programmed to change scenes. So if I was to come and show Alan actually interacting with the scenes, you can see how Alan, by pressing just a single button that's already pre-programmed, can actually change the scenes that you're looking at across the different devices that we're either getting feeds from the inside of or the cameras that we're getting feeds from as well. Now, this may sound pretty difficult, but it's actually fairly straightforward. If you just hooked up a Stream Deck to your computer, you could pre-program using this application we are using, which is OBS, which is Open Source uh, Open Source Broadcaster. And we actually use OBS to do these entire shows that we do. Um, and it's very simple to take scenes that are already in OBS and program those into the Stream Deck. And so you as an educator could actually program, if this is a remote class you were doing, you could actually program the Stream Deck with the different scenes that you want to have and then just be able to tap those in order to change it. And then you don't need a producer essentially in the room with you. Although it's really nice to have Alan in the room with me. <laughs> so there he is. <laughs> so um, the other thing that we, uh, we do is we, you would probably wonder like, how did I get those fake people into my call? Well, you probably wouldn't do this very often, but I actually have four different devices, each one representing a different person that joins the call. And then I actually put tape over the camera and if you turn on the background and then you tape over the camera, you'll see what the background is. It's a little trick, it's a little hack, it works really well. Um, and I and it's a, something that somebody on the Teams team taught me. And then finally, we have a secondary camera that we can actually use to give close-ups and other things so you could have different camera views, but that is certainly not something that you would need in your environment. So again, just having a device like something like a Surface Book 3 or the studio laptop or laptop studio that Matt's about to show you and having a camera on a tripod and then running maybe OBS on this device and then having a stream deck, you could be doing all these same types of things that we're doing in our own environment in this space as well. So I'm going to stop connecting from my device, my Surface Duo and come back and are we taking questions throughout or are we... Uh, we take yeah, uh, questions uh, just at the end. Let's take a pause there, Frank, and see if we have any questions. I do want to sure. emphasize, like, uh, part of the setup, which is awesome. I learned this personally, and I use this software to stream my kids' soccer games uh, remotely across my 
or across my Duo device. Um, you know, you're using a lot of this to showcase the actual hardware. And in a lot of cases, the hardware itself can be the presenting platform. You don't have to have like this enormous setup, but it, to showcase hardware, it's a little different when you're showcasing a hub, which is normally your presenting device. Um, I'm going to see, does anybody have questions? You feel free to come off a of mute, uh, turn your camera on if you want. Raise your hand. Anything? I will say that both Dr. Kellerman and Dr. Mohan, they use a secondary camera. And the reason the value of the secondary camera is being able to see the instructor and being able to see the content is a very nice thing. And then at times, like what we're able to do, like Alan can jump inside the Surface Hub, we can take a feed from directly what's inside the device and be able to show that as well. So it's, it's not that complicated of a setup and the value that it brings is that I could have people in the classroom with me here or I could have people remote and everybody is at an eight even playing field. Well, Frank, I don't, um, first, thank you for presenting all of, on all of this. This is awesome. Yeah. Um, I actually learned quite a few things through this session. I hope others did too. I didn't see anybody else have any other questions. Um, and if nobody has any other questions, we're gonna, we're gonna kind of pivot. Uh, so thank you again so much for doing this and uh, showing us this uh, awesome setup you have here. Yeah, absolutely. All right, um, we're gonna go ahead and transition. If there are no questions, we're gonna transition over uh, to Matt Camusi, who is going to spend the next hour and a half talking about Surface Laptop <laughs> Studio. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe maybe 15 minutes, maybe 15 minutes. I, I want to say I, I brought Matt on here uh, for this team because it's very rare we get a, a, an opportunity to both bring both Frank, who's a specialist in Hub, but also to bring Matt. And after our launch of the Surface uh, Laptop Studio, I learned a ton. A lot of things that this team may um, you know, be wondering in the back of their mind, like why is things different? Why did you do things? So Matt is the person I go to for all of my technical questions and sits on the team that really knows everything dirty. So um, Matt, with that said, you know, I've worked you up, um, you know, doing yeah. just Laptop Studio. Nice. Yeah, this is great. I've been I've been like you you served as a great hype man here at Casey and now I get to follow this incredible studio uh, demo from Frank, which I assume he runs out of his uh, second bedroom uh, or, or closet. Um, yeah, so uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, Laptop Studio, which I, I is one of my favorite devices, especially of the of the uh, new um, the new launch of products that we we just announced in our now GA. Um, and would it be possible if we have the uh, slides up just to sort of guide through? Yeah, you uh, want a visual? I have the one slide. That's perfect. Yeah, okay. honestly, that's all I need. I'm not one for for slides. So, perfect, um, but yeah. just as a little visual indicator, what I've got here is the laptop studio for anyone who has not been able to sort of see it just yet, right? So this is what it looks like. Um, you might have seen some of the images on here. I, I, I am on a Brio myself. I also am a big fan. Uh, the, the, the Windows Hello sign in is, is, is pretty awesome. Um, but otherwise, you know, this is the best I can do. Um, but it does have a very uh, particularly uh, different uh, form factor, especially if you were expecting something in the book line to look more like the uh, like the book two, the book three, etc. So um, so there's a lot of different uh, reasons for this. Um, there are, uh, you know, like there's this is really like the, the next one in the succession of Surface Books. Um, and yeah, it kind of was a big divergence from from how we wanted to do things. But with that came a lot of really, I think, some of our some of the coolest engineering decisions that have been made in one of these Surface products. And, and I'm happy to talk about some of those. Um, uh, so the uh, yeah, are we doing a drop test? Honestly, you know what? That that kind of leads us into one of uh, one of the biggest things about it is that if I were to drop it, this is one of the most repairable devices we have created as of yet. Um, and so what that means is that you can effectively repair or under like you know basically like we do advise like those who are professional IT folk or field repair folk to be able to do it, but you can kind of repair um, everything on this thing. Um, so that, you know, like there's this bottom plate that exists in the bottom here, um, which if you were to pop that off, you'd actually see that the battery is attached to that. So if you need to switch off that battery uh, uh, back plate combo, that's something that you can do. Um, you pretty much can replace everything, display, keyboard, all of the, wor all of the works um, uh, and repair those or, or swap those between devices. Um, uh, with varying amounts of difficulty. I'll put that nuance on there. So it's a step forward in terms of being able to repair the device, which is kind of awesome, um, especially for some of us who have been paying attention to that, to that recently. This was 
something I was very happy about personally. Um, but um, but as I mentioned, there's that nuance of like some stuff is more easy to repair than others. So for example, the keyboard, which is you know honestly like a highlight of the device, the keyboard I have to admit is really really nice. That keyboard, I don't know how easy it is to see, but it is kind of part of the chassis. So what's knowing about it is that we actually have had a lot of components that while along the way are repairable and replaceable. So you can even swap out the motherboard, which has that uh, onboard uh, memory. Um, it is soldered onto it. I'll talk about that in a moment. Hey, Matt, um, but, just real yep. quick, sorry to interrupt you. Maybe we should yeah, spotlight so we could see you um, a little bit better because we're seeing the slides really big. Sure. Um, so let's let's in the slides real quick and let's just spotlight Matt. Okay, sounds good. We've already got him on spotlight for everybody. Yeah, I was gonna say we slides. should have him on spotlight, so we're good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Normally, I try to spare folks from having to look at my face for so long, but I agree that in this case, <laughs> this is important. So, um, so yeah. So the keyboard is basically like slap against the chassis here, and so you do have to get some other components along the way. It's a little bit more annoying, but it is part of the. Uh, it is replaceable, repairable, and that is you know understood to be uh, something that we. Uh, expect to be replaced with some amount of frequency because we're all humans who spill things on keyboards. And I say this as somebody who's gone through like his fifth or sixth mechanical keyboard in like three years. So, uh, which is pretty bad now that I say it out loud. Um, but otherwise, this is, you know, this is the laptop studio. Um, you probably um, are familiar with this laptop form factor, this clamshell form factor. Um, some of you, if you haven't seen this yet, this is going to probably blow your mind, but otherwise I think everybody has seen it. I can basically snap this forward. And then you can see that it sort of just has the ability, has like a dual hinge kind of system here. And this allows it to sort of just uh, move to different postures. There are magnets that are right here on the chassis itself, which allow it to effectively say, stay very, very tightly snapped to that to that position. This is kind of what we call stage mode. You might also hear it referred to as studio mode. Um, but uh, but uh, this gives you access to the trackpad, which I think is honestly one of our better ones. And I say this from the engineering perspective, um, uh, you know, that I'm very happy with it. Um, and so, yeah, I am one of the few with this device, but you know, at the same time, I don't have a hub and I'm looking at you guys with like a bunch of hubs and I'm jealous, but anyway. <laughs> um, and then it of course can also collapse all the way down like that, right? Uh, which is actually um, something that I've been using uh, with this a lot. Um, I do a lot of illustration. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really all up in Inktober right now, which is pretty awesome uh, to do uh, on something so Matt, like this. Like, like unlike the previous books and the other devices that are on the marketplace, like you're able to write on that and leverage the high-end GPU that's inside of there to take advantage of all the high-end graphics. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. So um, what's cool about there's two cool things about that. One. This has the ability to, like, here's a Slim Pen 1. I don't have the Pen 2 yet, believe it or not. It's really hard to get our hands on those. Um, here's a Slim Pen 1. There is a little dip here, which, you know, was a cause of concern for a lot of people, that the fact that there's, like, this elevated platform, because we have, like, this heat sink here, which I'm going to talk about in just a second. Um, you rarely get even notice that that platform, in my opinion, because you're looking at it from this angle most of the time, that kind of disappears underneath the device. But right underneath that lip is where you can actually... There's a magnet here. I don't know if I can demonstrate how powerful this is, but if I were to just sort of like get real close to it and it just pulls it out of my fingers, um, it also serves as a wireless charging area for that pen. Um, and so sitting in this particular device is an RTX A2000 um, display adapter, which for those of you who are really into graphics uh, cards and display adapters and so on, RTX is basically the new... Um, what you call uh, 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 it's it's basically the the new marketing name for what used to be Quadro, right? So if you're familiar with the Quadro line, that that name series has basically completed. This is still that same sort of lineage. It just happens to be called RTX. This one's the RTX A2000 in this uh, particular device, um, which is particularly powerful. But of course, it depends on which skew of the device you you end up getting, um, and. Uh, to sort of like cap that off, like being able to, so I, I draw on this thing with with base, some very basic like software um, for for uh, illustration, Adobe Suite, and so on. Um, but uh, but it's nice because this does have that 120 hertz dynamic uh, refresh uh, capability, right? So um, somebody once tried to convince me that 60 hertz is all you need, and I I almost 
laughed uh, very rudely because of the no. I do a lot of gaming and 120 hertz is minimum for me nowadays. Um, but the nice thing about these is that it is a variable refresh rate. You can see that you've seen most likely some newer devices coming out with that, especially phones and such. And the reason it makes a big difference is it just feels really buttery smooth, getting more frames in per, spec per second on that screen. And the reason I say dynamic for anyone who's not familiar is that it will change that refresh rate depending on what you're on, right? So for example, if I'm drawing on this with a stylus, it'll switch dynamically to 120 hertz so that it feels so much better, like I can feel less lag uh, as more frames with my drawing on it show up per second. But then if I switch to something that probably doesn't need to refresh that many frames per second, if it's a particular browser page or if it's a particular app that I'm in, right, like, uh, like an office app or something that doesn't need that increased uh, refresh rate, it'll drop down to that dynamically in order to do things like save battery life. All right, and that stuff can can really help out with tweaking out battery. Um, so the uh, uh, aside from that, like it is a really nice display. It is touch capable, pen capable, etc. You can fold it down. Um, it is also a particularly beefy device in terms of performance capability. And the reason that we're able to get there is we're able to get there with you know basically i5 core models um, uh, like uh, uh, of of the processor as well as i7s. Um, and uh, on top of that, the thing that I think many of us on the engineering side really get nerdy about, which might bore you all to tears, but I'm going to talk about it anyway because it's kind of awesome to me, is the thermal design of the device. Um, I say this, so first of all, I say this as a big fan, like one of my favorite devices is the Pro X, right? It's got a Qualcomm ARM processor and there, handles thermals like a dream. But there's still that need for like some of these beefy ones that have like that Intel and they and and, 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 and these higher end processors, the more high uh, processing they do, the more heat they generate. And unfortunately, a lot of times processors can only sort of operate to a certain performance limit before they have to start limiting their own performance due to thermals and so on. So what we did is, and actually, do you mind putting the image back up, the slide back up, um, so I can yeah. sort of demonstrate this a little bit? We did something kind of special and unique with the laptop studio, in which case there is this new sort of uh, shared uh, like uh, heat pipe uh, and heat uh, bus that goes across. Um, let me see. So this might be Wrong slide one. Sorry one. About that. Hang on. All good. <laughs> All good. Deaths going on. Keep talking. <laughs> no worries. Um, so yeah, uh, it's basically a shared heat configuration, here, uh, heat mechanism that goes across the CPU and the GPU on the device. Um, so you can kind of see that um, in the image in the, in the left-hand side, right? So you see that, that copperish looking thing, how it extends over both the CPU and GPU, CPU being there in the more centered in the middle, GPU off to the right. Um, and those fans that are located in the lower left and right corners are basically where the palm rests are. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, what's cool about this is that this shared, uh, we have sensors all over the device. And I mean, I have trouble sort of explaining what this is kind of doing. I'm sure you all would follow, but it's kind of like, you know, how, those, how like a lot of vehicles will have like the uh, all wheel drive and they'll dynamically like put more torque behind certain wheels, depending on what climate you're on to basically make sure that your car doesn't slip and so on. It's the same kind of idea but with thermals on this device in which we're, we have different sensors throughout the device that can identify heat, and identify which things are causing heat and effectively shift where we're, put, we're basically pumping heat from most. So the CPU has a little bit of, of, uh, of heat sinking capability, the GPU has it as well. But if we find uh, between the operating system and this is all orchestrated by something that we kind of wrote from the from the ground up, which is our surface management framework that runs on our chips, so that basically it will analyze and see, is the CPU generating most of the heat? Is the GPU generating most of the heat? If the CPU is generating a lot of the heat because it's being, it, there you have some sort of CPU intensive task, then it will actually dynamically allocate heat sink capabilities and share it from the GPU's side in order to distribute that heat and primarily focus on cooling the CPU. It'll do the same thing for the GPU and it'll balance as it needs to. This honestly is huge um, in terms of performance gains. We found that in a lot of our testing, this is something that significantly steps above what we found in, in similar mobile um, like form factors for these devices, which is, is, 
is massively impactful. And what's also cool is that the device is able to actually determine what posture your device is in. So if you were to move the screen to one portion to another, we can identify that. And for you know for Windows, that's nice because we can light like light, light up different features. Like if you push it to stage mode, then we'll you know turn it into sort of like a tablet interface and, and make it easier for touch and pen. But what's also happening is that the palm rests next to the uh, trackpad are where those fans are located. And if we find that you are in a posture that doesn't use that pa the palm rests, like if you lay it completely flat, we can actually then use that as a as like a, a clue to spin up those fans even more, which are whisper quiet because we have a lot of open ventilation underneath the device now. We can pick in some decently sized fans and dynamically allocate that. So all of this, and I know I geeked out about the thermals of the thing, but what this really translates to is this device stays crazy quiet for the amount of heat that it dissipates. And on top of that, the amount of heat that it dissipates allows us to really pump more power out of the processor without fear of thermal throttling, which is pretty awesome for anyone who does a lot of really intense work on these things. Um, and Matt, so yeah. I have a question. I have a question. You spent a lot of time on the thermal uh, pieces. Probably too um, much, but please. <laughs> Well, you got three minutes left. Um, can you can you like you, you've obviously emphasized this? So the point I think that also the, really this leads into is the battery life across the device. As you reduce the heat, you are able to extend the battery life. Am I hearing this correctly? And can you just talk a little bit about like we hold a very high standard for temperature and heat um, uh, compared to skin? And I forget how we say it, but uh, you, can you? Just, I know we only got a couple of minutes left, but could you kind of talk about that real quick too? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, basically, uh, you know, we, we the exterior of our devices is metal. Metal conducts heat. And so we definitely want to keep an eye on our skin temperature thresholds and everything like that. But the more that we can dissipate heat, the less that we have to like uh, worry about um, uh, device throttling and so on. And, we, and uh, we can then therefore more accurately balance between the power of the processor, the heat dissipation of the device, and stay, and also just the battery life of the device. Um, so the battery on these things lasts um, surprisingly long for the kind of work that that uh, that you can typically do on it. Um, and uh, it does still use like a surface connector if you do need to charge this up. It also leverages something called battery protection mode, which um, you might have seen on some of your devices, but when you plug this in and light it up, it'll tell you it'll have a little hard icon next to the battery in Windows 11, at least, that'll basically limit your battery capacity to 80% if it's if the software identifies that you are um, like keeping this thing charged in all day to basically prevent the, the battery capacity lifetime from the overall lifetime from decreasing and being too low. So it makes sure that your battery stays healthy for a longer period of time for as long as it can. And that's just a limitation of lithium ion. Um, and then I guess to, to toss one more thing in the ring, um, Thunderbolt slash USB 4. It's in there. <laughs> we have those two ports. Uh, it took us a while to get there. The biggest thing that held us back from doing that is um, DMA was a scary thing for us, direct memory access that Thunderbolt allows because it's a PCI Express technology. Um, and therefore we um, we had to first really come up with security mechanisms, which we came up with uh, something called kernel DMA protection, which basically allows that DMA access to happen within a virtualized container, um, which basically now allows us to leverage DMA but in a secure environment because it's a virtualized container. Um, and now we have access to using those technologies, which is pretty great. That's the thing that held us back the most. But now we're now we're good. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. And uh, I know we're coming up on time and we're getting ready to wrap up here. Man, what, this was pretty cool. I wish that we had like 30 or 40 more minutes for you to talk about <laughs> the other cool things, to be honest. I mean, this was really cool. And I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, big thanks to both you and Frank. Uh, for, for joining us today. I know it's super rare and, and I know it was very compact schedule for you. So I do appreciate it. I'm going to, um, so first, before we move on and the rest are going to be very quick, I promise. Um, in fact, Matt's kind of covered a couple of things. Is there any questions or anything? If there are, um, you know, just do in the interest of time and maybe giving people back some free time, I'm just going to quickly go through some of the common things um, that you may be, you know, kind of hesitating on in the past for Surface or maybe you're not up to date 
um, on our most uh, recent things with around serviceability and and warranty um, and some of the things that we've kind of done behind the scenes that we've had special groups in in beta programs. So just real quick, you know, I was a customer too, not too many moons ago. Um, so I kind of want to just really highlight the left side here. The protection plans are equivalent to anything that you've had uh, currently today in the market. And I'm just going to probably point out Dell because I think um, most of you probably are using Dell in higher education. Um, and if you kind of look, I know that it's a bit of an eyesore, but what I want to kind of highlight here is we do have a Microsoft Complete for Business Plus program, Next Business Day Replacement, uh, Advanced Exchange, Accidental Coverage is covered in this, Mechanical Breakdown, you can get two, three, and four years. So if, if you didn't know, um, we've been offering this now, I think for probably going on, maybe this is our third year, um, but it's the same type of coverage that you would expect from any of your OEMs today that um, you may be purchasing from or you know any of the competitors outside of Windows. So that's probably first and foremost. Um, second, Matt really did a good job of talking about serviceability. So as you look at all of our product lines, I just I really wanted you to see the names on these, uh, not every detail below it. But as we continue to innovate and produce more products, everything that you're going to start noticing going forward, we're continuing to make these uh, devices repairable and field serviceable so that you know you don't have to send in the whole unit when one one thing potentially breaks or there's a failure on one thing. Um, and Matt already highlighted this, but as you can kind of see, you know, there's different points on on the uh, laptop studio that are repairable. You'll notice probably your eyes might go right to service appear, uh, serviceability through an authorized partner. You know, our long term goal and we've been working on for quite a long time is to not just make it where Microsoft can repair the devices, but those that you um, purchase through your, you know, the resellers today that can repair them. And then there's other, you know, programs where we have, but we really want our long term goal is to be able to have you guys repair these devices. Um, I probably, I, you know, probably the most exciting thing that I've totally forgotten about is our Surface Hub. It was probably one of the most repairable devices that we've had in the market for such a long time. So when you look at the the um, Surface Hub, you know, it is actually repairable, you know, without actually sending the entire unit in um, and taking it. Um, uh, you know, the advanced exchange process. And if you can move on, Kristen. Last but not least, this is something I feel is really important, for, I think, for everybody on the call, especially if you have uh, maybe a team member that manages Surface today and you're like, hey, what's the difference really? What, Where is Microsoft at in terms of being able to give me kind of like a portal or access to see where all my devices are at? What is my warranty coverage? Can, how do I submit maybe even a support ticket without ever calling a single person? Um, or see all my tickets that I currently have today? Or what about, what is news? Um, you know, what are those um, kind of top things that are coming up in the IT blogs around uh, the Surface um, device? So we've been working on this, uh, you know, kind of project for quite a while, but we finally released it. We nominate customers to be in it. It's a one-stop shop for you to go into called the Surface Management Portal within Azure that gives you the access and the ability to just do all the things that you guys are used to doing possibly in other products, but it's all in one spot. So you can monitor your, your health of the devices, again, the warranty, your coverage, your support, your tickets, everything can be done through the service uh, management portal. And I think I got two more slides real quick. So I know I was going quickly. Um, so what would I suggest is kind of some next steps? Um, in fact, I think we have one more slide. So. What I would suggest is the next step is there's a lot to learn. There's a lot of deep dive sessions that we really want to encourage you to, to take a look at where Frank goes into a little bit more around, um, you know, what's possible with even third party products. Like there's a lot of things that Surface Hub supports just besides first party stuff, a lot of third party stuff. Um, so there's some great talk tracks there. Um, underneath there are some additional sessions that are coming up. So if you're interested in modern management, uh, there's a session on that coming up, a security track, transforming uh, employee productivity and your experience. All of these sessions, I want to just encourage you, and we got one more slide here, where um, your Surface um, specialist can help you get connected. And so if you have questions, over on the left-hand side, you can see the Surface education sellers. These are the folks that cover the entire United States. They cover somewhere. So if you find your region, those are the Surface sellers that sell today. There's another group of us, um, including myself, that we really, um, we're called the kind of the uh, Surface Education SEAL team. So we kind of blend over into several regions. So we have a little bit broader area. Um, but our goal uh, is to help you with, uh, you know, not just understanding how Surface fits in, but if you have technical questions or you just need a little bit of guidance or us to point you in the right direction, or maybe you're just having some problems or, or you're not sure what's going on with a, a few of the things in, you know, in the Surface world, 
all of us are available to reach out to you. So if you can, uh, again, jot down, we'll share this deck out. I know Steve's recording this session. Take note of who your surface specialist is, your SEAL team member. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us. And with that said, Kristen, I think that was the last si slide. Mm -hmm. So I want to just thank anybody. And if you want to come off mute, you can turn your camera on. Don't be shy. Uh, I know everybody's been cameras off the entire time. But if you have any questions, I mean, we'll, we'll stick around for, you know, the next 10 minutes or 15 minutes um, and answer questions. Don't be afraid to ask us anything. And maybe if we need to, we can even stop the recording. Yeah. Sure. And uh, Caden, are you going to throw the link in there or did you throw it in there already? I am Sorry. grabbing it right now. Perfect. So, um, Please take a moment to fill out the link, uh, fill out the survey that Caden is going to link in there. Hey guys, great job. Thank you for ending before six o'clock because it's 6 p.m. tonight. Dune goes live on HBO Max. I'm watching it. <laughs> gotta do what you gotta do. Thanks exactly. for that reminder. I needed there something after midnight, midnight mass, so that works out perfectly. There you go. <laughs> and there's no hockey on tonight, right, Steve? Oh, there is. There's, um, I can do both. <laughs> We're in season. Uh, There's always gonna be hockey. There's a Kraken game. Oh, oh yes, I forgot about the Krakens. Yeah. Um, right. I see still a lot of people. I can't, are I can't. I can't say that because I'm being recorded. So never mind. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If there's no, there's, if anybody has any questions, please come off mute. Um, type it in the chat. If not, we will give everybody back a, a few minutes. And again, thank you to the team for um, presenting. It was very informative. I'm going to stop recording at this point. Hey, thank you, Steve.